Greetings, everyone. I'm excited to welcome Ravi Sunday Pudi, co-founder and CEO at Effective to the show. Ravi, welcome. Thanks, Ben. Hey, great to have you here. Let's dive right in. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, it started off my career and I, at Google was part of their fraud and risk team for about eight years or so. Worked quite a bit on a bunch of Google products on, on the safety fraud side of things on search for, for a while and then on Google Pay. We got to work on pretty interesting things like money laundering and transaction fraud and attacks from from even nation states <laughs> on, on, on Google. So yeah, it was pretty exciting and we lo- I learned a lot there and then left to join a startup called Simility which was also a fraud detection software company. I got to join them very early on. In fact, was their first employee. The co-founders were my colleagues at Google. So I was I got the opportunity to see the whole startup journey from very early on with them. We eventually got acquired by PayPal in 2018. And with that, again, we were part of PayPal's risk team. Worked, again, quite a bit on, on a pretty large scale with them. Got to do bunch of things like build out new products within the PayPal ecosystem and then uh, things of that sort. Then, yeah, after a few years there, left to finally start something on my own, again in the fraud space. <laughs> I have three other co-founders, so all three of them uh, were my early colleagues from Simility and PayPal. So, very exciting. Yeah, love that history. So I assume we had great experience working at Google, their fraud risk. I can't even imagine like the the <laughs> challenges in that in that department uh, for global fraud and risk. And then you have acquired startup PayPal. So great experience in that. Uh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about Effective. What products and services does Effective offer? Yeah. No, thanks, man. Yeah. Effective, continuing in the fraud space, my whole career has <laughs> been in this domain and uh, the same for my founder my co-founders as well before similarity they were also in the fraud and and risk ecosystem so we are continuing in the fraud space so we this time around we are focused on serving more mid-sized financial institutions so like credit unions community banks mid-sized lenders fintech companies and so on we got very excited about about Serving the space when we get got to learn about them uh, with the similarity experience, and we also saw that the space was very underserved from multiple technology aspects, but uh, especially on the fraud side, there were there were not a lot of tech companies building out products specifically for credit unions, for example. So we really wanted to do that. More importantly, after we learned the scale. And the importance that credit credit unions and community banks have in the U.S. economy, right? So two thirds of the population have a relationship with either a community bank or credit union. A lot of the economy actually runs on it from small businesses to personal loans and things of that sort. So, um, I mean, when I immigrated to the U.S., my first account was with a credit union because no one else would (laughs) let me open up a bank account because I had no, like, I didn't even have a social security number. I didn't have any credit history. So, so yeah, very indebted to, to that ecosystem. So we really wanted to build something out for the space. Love it. So serving those mid-sized financial institutions, yeah. credit unions, community banks, and, and fraud, I, I assume, can be a broad topic. So what does this mean for these institutions? Is it un- unauthorized access? Is it trying to transfer funds out of an account that you don't own? Tell me, like, what does fraud mean in this context? Uh, great question, Ben. It's all of it, right? So, so that's the problem we noticed with, with this ecosystem is um, a lot of the financial institutions that are this size don't have the bandwidth or the technical know-how to go pick and choose different vendors for each of these fraud problems like the larger banks have, right? And so what we tried to build was a full risk infrastructure stack for, for these customers. And with Effective, we have this very sophisticated platform that that looks at risk from end to end, right? So starting from account onboarding, so when someone applies for an account or a loan or a card from one of the FIs and running KYC, fraud checks, money laundering checks, and in some cases, even credit risk, right? So underwriting for a loan, followed by transactions. So looking at transactions in real time, transaction fraud, 
and transaction monitoring and things of that sort. And also non-financial events like login, pin change, profile change, password change, so those kinds of events. So any kind of action that might need a risk adjudication, we try to support those on our platform. Yeah, it seems like a good space. I know when I drive around in Denver, it seems like every other corner, there's a community bank or credit union, yeah. you know, that you've never heard of. So, <laughs> and so you can easily then your, your product can integrate, you know, into their infrastructure then to exactly. apply that, that fraud, like you said, that fraud system or infrastructure for That's them. right. That's right. Yeah. So we plug into like the core banking systems, the account opening platforms, payment hubs, all those kind of things, and then flow all those events into our platform and then take like decisions on, like take the decisions and or, or add friction when truly needed, right? Like when, for example, when someone is applying for an account and we notice a little bit of a fraud risk, right? Their, their email address, the email domain is like some new email domain that not like a Yahoo or Gmail, but something brand new. So, so there is a little bit of risk, but we don't want to stop them from opening an account. But then we remember that risk, right, for that user. And now once they start initiating transactions and they also do something suspicious, right? Like they deposit a check and within two hours, drawing the money out from a ATM. So now those risks get add up and then we hit, they hit a threshold where now we try to add some friction, right? Hey, let's let's do a two-factor auth. Let's verify with the user. Or even like hold, put a hold on the account before they do any further actions. That's right. Yeah, but I love that. Yeah, so important. And I've even had, I got an email one day that, you know, for a bank I don't bank at said, hey, your credit card's on the way. And I thought, oh, this is a spam. But I called yeah. them like, no, we're sending a credit card to an ad address that you don't live at. So I was like... Yeah, it happens, you know, obviously right. more than, than we know exactly, out there. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely needed. So what, what year did you found effective? In uh, 2021, so mid 2021 uh, was when we left PayPal to, to start effective. At the first six months, uh, we did a lot of user research, wanted to understand this ecosystem a lot more and then built out a product. And then uh, early 2022 was when we started actively uh, selling our services. Okay. And then do you get, have a headquarters location or are you remote? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we have a headquarters uh, in San Francisco. So that, that's where I'm based, but we are fully remote. So I'm the only one here. All of my <laughs> co-founders are very distributed. And so I have another co-founder here in, in the Bay Area, but uh, our third co-founder, Jonathan, is in London. Anupam is in Bangalore. And we have team members in, in those times. And then tell us about your team. What's your current team size? Yeah. We are, we are smallish. So we are about 25 people. But all of the folks we work together are there from the, their like similar domain we've been in. So we've been able to operate really well with by still maintaining a small team. But we are fully remote, right? So that's I think one thing that a lot of our customers appreciate because we we our fraud platform is real time and we operate in real time transactions as well, like FedNow and RTP and things of that sort. And those are twenty four by seven transaction systems, right? So they really appreciate that they can reach us at any time, any day, like twenty four by seven. And there's one of us always available to work with them. Yeah, that's great. And any anything you want to share around your ARR revenue range right now? Yeah, I wouldn't go into specifics, but like last year was our first full operating year, right? So we we launched in uh, January, late January, and then we ended the year quite well, hit our targets of reaching the million ARR in the first year itself, uh, and then second year is going well. I mean, the usual multiples. I we'll know at the end of the year, but. So far, going going really well. We want to double or triple our revenue, and I think we will be getting there pretty confidently. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, great mark to hit. And tell us a little bit about your go-to-market motion. If you're serving community banks, credit unions, seems like very specific niche that you know who you're after, who to contact. So tell yeah. us a little bit about how you're landing your prospects, how you're reaching them. Yeah. 
Uh, we also serve fintechs, but again, in the mid mid size. And a lot of our fintechs in turn use credit unions and community banks behind the scenes because they're vast platforms and things of that sort. So eventually we get to work or they have sponsor banks right behind the scenes. So we still uh, end up serving the banking ecosystem. But but yeah, when we sell directly to credit unions and banks, uh, it, it was hard. <laughs> we had to figure that out. I mean, that they are a very close knit community. Uh, if you're familiar with that space, uh, especially in the credit union ecosystem, since they don't compete with each other, they rely very heavily on like peer recommendation for for like vendor selection or technology selection and things of that sort. Um, so it was a little hard to to get our first few customers in that in that space, but now they're. They're so collaborative with us. So in fact, like we call them partners and customers. So, so they help us build. They also recommend us to all of their peers uh, and, and things of that sort. So we are trying to rely on and like use our first set of customers as a seed to, to grow. But more importantly, it's, I think it's very important to, to have FaceTime. Seems like cliched at this time and day, a time of where everything is virtual, but but they really appreciate meeting you in person, right? So I would strongly recommend my peers who are also trying to serve into the space to to meet folks in person. And and trade shows, conferences are are great ways to do it. And we we try to attend a lot of those, as many as we can. Yeah, and that, yeah, great point there because me as an outsider, I think, hey, it's easy to identify, identify, get a list of community banks, credit unions, fintech, mm-hmm. all right, easy, let's go email them, call them. But then mm-hmm. knowing a little bit about that market where you said they're a tight knit, they like referrals, recommendations from their other banks, right. and they like to be in person. So understanding that that yes. niche and that market right. so you can fine tune, fine tune your go to market. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, they're very like passionate about serving that community, right? So, so they almost always look at the work that they're doing as a service to their community. And that's, uh, that was very eye opening for us because we always thought like banks and bankers are very commercial, uh, but that's not true for community banks and trade unions. So, so really understanding what, what they're trying to serve. Oh, how how do they want to serve their community? What are the pain points? Goes a very long way, and that you can only create that rapport when you're able to meet that person physically. Yeah, appreciate that insight. And tell us a little bit about your pricing. Is it traditional subscription pricing? Is it a mix yeah. of usage? Tell us a little bit of how we price your product. Yeah, yeah. I think that this is something that we learned as well during our initial research period. Is how these organizations procure like software, right? And one of the most important software that procure is their core banking system and all the subsequent modules that, that come along with it. And usually it is, it's like a license fee with some variability and long periods, right? So they, they put a lot of trust in, in, in the software that they're buying. So it's not usually month by month, which like, Fintechs usually like they're on the other side of the spectrum, right? So, so they prefer like month by month here. They want to go really long and build that relationship with you. Uh, so here, what we, another thing that we learned is what, like generally what they like to do is have like a predictable cost structure, right? Because they go through their board for budget approvals. So if there's too much variability, it's hard to get an approval right away. So we try to do a combination of both. So it, it's like SaaS pricing, but tiered. So there is a fixed fee as long as they are in certain volume tiers, right? So they don't, they don't see any spikes in, in, in cost suddenly, unless they're really seeing growth uh, and usage, which they're fine with. So, and that also helps us because one, it's predictable income for us, right? And more often than not, customers tend to pick a higher tier uh, just to be safe, right? Because they're getting the budget approved. They're rather for a higher number than a better number. So that's also great because they're picking a higher tier. It's fixed income, fixed cost for them. So they are happy. It's fixed income for us. So very predictable revenue growth for us. So, 
seems so far like a good, good position to be in. Yeah, and I appreciate that insight. I mean, that's just really understanding your customer segment, your ideal customer profile. Like you said, how do they procure? How do they buy? Do they need board approvals? They like predictability. They want to be a little bit more conservative, even if it means going into that upper tier right. just to be safe. So really love that insight. Now, when you talk long periods for multi-year contracts, are you talking, do they sign three-year contracts, five-year, seven-year? How long do they sign for? Yes. Oh, three years seems to be the... Uh, minimum, <laughs> right? For core banking platforms, usually go for five years, right? The other thing is, yeah, like it's because once you integrate, the switching costs are so high that it's always better for them to to go in deeper. So we we range with with banks between like three to five years. Yeah, it makes sense. So three to five year multi multi year contracts. That's right. Let's switch over to the the fundraising front. So how much yeah. capital have have you raised to date? Yeah, uh, total we've raised over nine million. It's about nine point five million, I would say. I think this or that same. Okay. We raised through two rounds, like through two seed. So the first one you could call it pre seed because this was pre product development, and very very early, like right. But a few months after we started, and that was from Excel. And the second round we raised almost exactly a year later, which is last, late last year, from a fund called Better Tomorrow Ventures here in San Francisco. They're, they're a very focused fintech fund. Um, the grid, a huge network here. That's uh, a good combination of one very large fund and one smaller, more nimble funds there have been we've, we've had like really good good experience working with both the different insights from, from both yeah and okay so about 9.5 yeah. million raised to date and we could say pre-seed and then a seed round mm -hmm. and tell us the evolution of that because you mentioned the pre-seed round was pre-product development That's right. so tell us the logic or thoughts around raising that pre-seed where were you and then what triggered then the seed yeah. round yeah no, that's a great question. So the pre-seed happened after like a letter of intent or a commitment from our first customer. We didn't have a product yet, so we couldn't obviously invoice them yet, but but it showed that there is already traction and we were confident that we were onto something, right? So only then we we felt it made sense to raise money because if not, you I mean, it might look, feel nice that you've gotten money, but we know from experience that it will just lead to bad things, right? So unless you're confident that, that you're going to utilize the money for, for something that you know, uh, you shouldn't raise a lot of money. So, so that's something that we did. And also Axel was our lead investor in Simility. So they knew us really well. They also knew the space, the fraud detection ecosystem really well. And our partner, Dinesh, he's, he was a great partner for us at, at Simility and even now, right? So we... He had an inherent trust uh, with him. So he was great to have very early on. We, we had the opportunity to work with him. And then seed was when we were getting to that million in AR, right? So early product market fit, resonate, we were resonating in the space. We were winning against some of our competitors, all that kind of stuff. And it was time we felt to get a little bit more capital to to start pushing through, right? Like and going to conferences, all that kind of stuff and being a little out there. So I appreciate that insight. So that pre-seed round, no product yet, but you have that customer LOI. So I assume yeah. those funds, you'll know, start, you know, creating a product. It and then, then the seed round, as you're seeing some product market fit, some wins against competitors. And then that seed round, that allocation of capital, was it to further develop the product and also now yeah, to experiment sure. yeah. in sales and marketing. That's right. That, like, yeah. Two things. One, like building up more, more advanced features, more nuanced features on our platform, like you mentioned. And two, more importantly, was our GTM activities, right? So hiring our sales and marketing folks and spending that money on, on sales and GTM. Okay. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And then... In the pre-seed and seed rounds, any lessons learned in that process that you'd like to share with other yeah, founders? Yeah, yeah. So pre-seed was this 2021 peak period, right? 
far easier to get capital at that time. And we were careful. I mean, we had some lessons learned from similarity and things of that sort and tried not to repeat, but but we did get lured into like building out a team very quickly because like, we got the capital pretty quickly and all that kind of stuff. In hindsight, we should have been a little bit more conservative in, in growing our team. Like we were 20 then, we are 25 now. So, so obviously we have tried to slow down and, and better utilize the team and things of that sort over course of time. But I think, yeah, there was something that we could have done a little bit better. We went, I think we spent maybe a quarter more in like pure product development than, than actively selling. Maybe we should have started selling in, in late Q4 rather than mid of Q1 in 2021, right? So all of that, I think, but lessons, I think in hindsight, we should have, we should have been a little bit more careful, but times were so crazy in 2021. <laughs> we got a little lured into, into that kind of mind space, but luckily it didn't happen for too long, right? So yeah. we got into rhythm, into a much better rhythm very quickly. After. Yeah. And I appreciate those lessons learned. And then at your current stage of your business, sounds like right, you've passed a million ARR and, and growing nicely. Yeah. Do you have a favorite number or metric that you're focused on to manage the business right now? Yeah. So one of the important things from this year uh, that also forced us, right? Like, for example, in Q2, our uh, sales funnel, like, just went dry. Like, comp so all the banks who were talking to us just went silent for obvious reasons, right? Like, the SVB uh, fiasco happened and a lot of community banks and regional banks were just like, hey, like, doesn't make sense for talking to with new vendors. I need to <laughs> have other priorities in, in mind. And the same thing happened with fintechs, obviously, right? Like their funding right up. So we, it was a little bit scary in early Q2. Now it's obviously, I mean, back to close to normal, I would say. But that forced us into building some discipline, right? From our expenses, planning, more importantly, paths towards baking even, right? So... And then eventual profitability. I think uh, that we we always had a plan to work towards it, but that just sped up our our activity, uh, and that discipline is helping us now, right? Like it's always great to be super disciplined. And the other thing uh, to really hone in our GTM activities because we provide multiple kinds of fraud protection modules uh, for our customers. It also forces us to upsell to our existing customers, right? So we were, we always knew that that could be a big revenue source, but we planned on doing it later, right? So we were just focused on new logo growth and things of that sort. But because the sales funnel just dried up, we were to keep our revenue ticking. We were, we were forced to talk to our existing customers, upsell additional modules, things of that sort. And that worked and that built, brought in that culture within the team as well. To, to focus on it. So I think, yeah, luckily we were small enough to act and react very quickly and we got some really solid learnings from it. So, so yeah, again, 2021, I think we would not have, like, this discipline wouldn't have been forced onto us. Right? So now we are very happy, right? Like we are, we are yeah, I love that. And when, where are you on that growth versus profitability spectrum? Are you break even now? Yeah. Or are you burning a little cash? We are very controlled on our burn, which is good. And we have a number that we are trying to maintain and we are maintaining it month over month. We have a inflection point, uh, I think close to like when you're touching close to like around 5 million, I think we'll be getting there. And then we have, we would have the luxury to take that call, right? So if you are able to raise capital or depending on what our board decides, we can, we'll have that luxury to take that call, right? Like, do we, do we now focus on profitability or uh, hit another wave of growth, right? And, and then push that target to the next milestone. So I think that is great. So we, 
it's always great to have that option and, and a clear line of sight in, in your current state of business. Having a clear line of sight of profitability is always great. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, as a CFO, yeah, you have yeah. to have line of sight on, yeah. on a path to profitability. Right. And you mentioned your board. So I'm just curious at this stage, pre-seed round, then seed round. Yeah. You know, what? what is that board composition uh, Great right question. Now? You've caught on to that really well. Yeah, so official. So these are all we've raised money on, like safe notes. So officially, there is no board formed other than as four co-founders. But again, we we made that habit to include top two investors in in those quarterly board meetings and things of that sort. Again, we wanted to force ourselves into having certain discipline running the business. And yeah, so even though. We don't need to have board me- like external mm. people at board meeting because it's all like safe notes so far. But we do do it because eventually they will be on our board, and we want to have that discipline and culture right away. And yeah, that's great insight. So even though officially no board, but you're treating it kind of you know going Correct. just like you had an official board and keeping right. your investors updated so they exactly. know what's going on. So right. yeah, love love that process. So Rob, we really appreciate the insight and sharing your experience so far. So as we wrap up here, what's coming up next for Effective that's new and exciting? Yeah, a lot of product development. Obviously, we use AI machine learning. I mean, it's core business of, of fraud, but I think the new developments in, in generative AI, LLM, then we, are, we've, we, are, we had the ability to use a lot of that uh, in our product features from auto-generating suspicious activity reports, uh, which are basically reports that Banks need to file to FinCEN um, when they notice certain kind of fraud patterns. So now we're using like LLMs to auto-generate them and file them automatically. So it's pretty exciting, uh, like adding a lot of these new features to our platform that are like driven by the new developments in AI. So that's new. And yeah, we are just heads down, focused on growth. We have a long runway still left. Good, good. Good investors, good customers. So, yeah, hopefully it'll run. Well, I love, really appreciate it. I love hearing the journey so far. And as we wrap up here, so if listeners would like to learn more about Effective, where should we send them online? Yeah, we are on LinkedIn, Effective Fraud Platform, or if you can search for, for us there. We are on Twitter as well, at Effective AI. Or you can just write to me, Ravi, at effective.ai anytime of the day. I would love to chat with anyone who's interested in speaking more. That's great. Well, really appreciate your time. So if you'd like to learn more about Ravi, check out effective.ai without the E at the end. That's or email Ravi at effective.ai to learn more. And Ravi, love the story. Appreciate you sharing your experience and insights today. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks.